would be so pretty if you would just do this one thing. If you would just do this one thing. If you would just get in your place. Get in your place, Susie Q. I saved it for you. Get in your lane, Susie Q. You are too big for your britches, but you can hide in my bed. I made it for you. Get in your place, Susie Q. You should be more grateful. Some people don't even know where their place is. I saved this space for you. Maybe you should cover some of that up, Susie Q. Or maybe you should show it all. Or maybe you should shake it, girl. Maybe you should shake it. I don't want it, though. But you should want me to, and I might if you try sometimes. And what kind of name is that anyway, Susie Q? Is that some kind of cultural thing? And did that come from your mother's people? And what kind of people are they anyway? And what kind of people are you? And what are you, Susie Q? Who told you that you do not need permission to speak? Who are you to use words like that? How dare your mouth be so big and not smiling? And maybe you should be more quiet, and maybe you should whisper in my ear first, before you speak out loud, Susie, everyone can tell you don't belong here. And if your feet were not so big, Susie, and if you were not so black, Susie, or if you could just be black enough, or maybe if your hips could narrow and your lips tuck in, if your hair could be more polite, if your face would just apologize, always arguing with itself so publicly, if you could just be pretty in a way that doesn't scare me, and why you always gotta scare me, Susie, and why do you spill over all of the cups and be so impossible to fold into boxes, and where is the cage? that can contain the inferno of your ideas and why is your mouth on fire, Susie? Why is your mouth always on fire? If you could be more, if you could be more simple, if you could be less, if you could be less black hole, if you could suck yourself in and swallow without taking all of us with you, we could forgive you, Susie. We could forgive you. Thank you for being here tonight. So since I was a very small child, people have asked me the age-old question, what are you? I am a poet. The poet Audre Lorde said, if I didn't define myself for myself, I would have been crushed into other people's fantasies for me and eaten alive. And this is very much what my poems do for me. My great-grandfather was a poet. And when he delivered the mail to my great-grandmother's house, he would sneak love poems in with the mail, which is how he won her over. And against her family's wishes, she ran off and married him, had 11 children with him, one of whom my grandmother raised me and introduced me to poetry. These poems made me possible, right? So what's even more re remarkable about this story is that my great-grandparents were born one generation outside of slavery. So these same love poems would have gotten their grandparents beaten, tortured, or even killed. These poems are my ancestry, my inheritance. Just before high school, I was sent to live in the suburbs with my mother and stepfather, and it was my first time experiencing what felt like a monoculture. The people there were not only all mostly the same race, but they dressed alike and talked alike and listened to the same music and watched the same television shows, and even their houses looked the same. And then there was me and all the questions about what I am. And eventually I learned to respond to all of these questions in poetry. During senior year of high school, a boy that I grew up with was shot at a local shopping mall. The next day at school, a girl I had never spoken to approached me, concern in her brow, asking sweetly, how's your friend? I was moved by her empathy. An exotic bird in a beige land of suburban track houses, I answered, he's still in critical condition, but we're all praying. My grandmother is down at the hospital now. She, head bobbing hair flip, smile shifting into quiet knife, replied, well, I still say if he was a gang member, he deserved to get shot. This poem is for Michelle Albright and what we deserve. You deserved both of my hands around your throat that day <laughs> and the shaking I gave you. You probably still live in some suburb somewhere in a house just like the one you grew up in. You are probably married to an insurance agent who played high school ball and still reminisces when he drinks too much on the weekends. You are probably a banker, one of those predatory mortgage lenders that gets rich by manipulating poor people. You probably have two kids who look exactly like you. You probably think that they deserve the best. Michelle, you never knew Cedric. Never saw the bruises he or his sister wore to Sunday school. 
Never tried not to fall asleep in the all-night prayer sessions the adults in our families held in hopes of protecting them from their stepfather. Never prayed for him to get saved. You never curled inside the kindness of their mother. Never grew roots in the forest of her song. You did not come to our reunions or revivals, never heard the desperation in our melody. You have never been unable to afford the arrogance of your godlessness, Michelle. You never saw Cedric smile. You never tried to beat him in a foot race. You never wept or prayed for him. You never knew why his manhood was so urgent or why it cost him so much blood to achieve. Michelle, I want you to know that he did survive and that when he recovered, he reclaimed his manhood the only way he knew how. That he was 17 when they locked him away for good, and the last time I saw him was at his mother's funeral. We were 18 then. They did not unshackle his hands nor his feet as he rattled to the pulpit to read a poem he had written for his dead mother, and all I could think about was you and what you said he deserved, Michelle. I still see his aunties and uncles and cousins sometimes. He is his family's phantom limb, but I know better than to stare or talk about it. My family has missing teeth of its own. Michelle, I am a mother now, and every night when I listen at my daughter's door, I can tell through the door the difference between asleep breathing, awake breathing, and awake pretending to be asleep breathing. <laughs> I have kissed her head and toes, cleaned her messes, read her books, wrote her lullabies, taught her to ride a bicycle and to swim, helped with homework, talked down teachers, spoken to the mothers of bullies, spoken to bullies, prayed and prayed and prayed. Michelle, I taught her to read. I taught her to speak, to speak up, even to me. I have washed and matched her socks over and over again, have had to send her out into a world that does not value her life that would tell her something about inferiority and it belonging to her, about her body and identity and it belonging to them, that pretends that black lives are not as carefully cultivated as white lives, as if she is not the most loved child that has ever lived, Michelle. I wonder what you think she deserves, Michelle. I know Cedric's mother felt the same way about her son that I do about my daughter. Michelle, what do you teach your babies? Michelle, do you know what a victim is? Do you think they always look like you? Michelle, have you ever felt like a statistic? Michelle, do you know they make whole juries just like you? Michelle, do you know the smack of a gavel can crack a spirit in half? Michelle, do you have a spirit? Michelle, we all deserve better than this. Even you.